Don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus said the very night will be betrayed. I'm going to prepare your home, and I'll come back to get you home someday. You know where I'm going. Tom said. reassured them with these words that will never pass away. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, believe in me, I am And I will give you rest, I will give you peace, in me you will find joy eternally, so come as a child with arms open wide, and I I am my father's only son, and no one comes to him except through me. If you really knew me well, you would know my father intimately. Lord, 
Jesus said, you've seen him now, cause I'm in him and he's alive in me. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, believe. spirit he will come in power to comfort and enable you to preach my word he will lead you in the truth that many won't accept but you hold on When the rain comes down on me When I look to heaven, clouds are all I see I think back to the saints of God Who really walk with the Lord 
They remind me when times get bad It's in God I'll be restored They tell me pray Good morning, guys. Good morning. And Merry Christmas. Yeah. Merry we Christmas. still say that around here. Can I also say that Jesus is the reason for the season? Yes. Amen. Amen. So uh, bless you guys on this foggy uh, Sunday morning, the Sunday before Christmas, right? Countdown begins. Um, anyway, let's, I want to go ahead and get started because we have a lot to do today, uh, a lot of good stuff. Do you mind standing with me? I'm going to open in prayer. We're going to go into... The throne room with worship after that. Yes, Father, we thank you. Lord, uh, I'm just always aware of the time of the year, Lord, and, and how we, it's funny how we act towards each other during this time of year, how we really should act all year. <laughs> um, good tidings of great joy and peace to one, with one another, Lord. That's really how we're supposed to be all the time, God. But the truth is, God, we're, we're also supposed to be aware of you. We're supposed to glorify you year-round, Lord. It's not just at Christmas time. So I just pray, Lord, next Sunday and the Sunday after that and the Sunday after that, we will indeed sing your praises in this place. We will indeed, God, in fact, as we ramp up for a new year here shortly, Father, may this be the beginning of something new and powerful that you want to do in this place, Father, we pray. We were expecting that, and we are expecting a powerful move of your spirit today, Lord, and we do indeed ask for that. I pray a blessing for each person that's here. I bless those that are still at home, Lord. We know several are still watching from home because they're fighting some kind of virus or illness, Lord. I pray, God, for healing. We believe, God, in your healing virtue. I pray that you would do a powerful move today, Lord, and those that are still struggling, Father. And, and God, uh, more than that, God, we pray that your presence would fall in a manifest way here and in each home, God, that is watching right now. In Jesus' name, have your way in all that's done. And all God's people said, amen. amen.
Father, we thank you for every prayer that is offered up before you today in this place. We thank you for every prayer that's offered from our hearts as we worship. Lord, you hear every heart's cry. Father, into our hopes, into our fears, the Savior of the world appears. You have come. You are here with all those who are watching today who are pain, with pain in their bodies, who are looking to you for a miracle, who are looking to you for a breakthrough. Father, together, collectively, I pray, Lord, this, we offer up our praise to you in this place, that your kingdom comes and your will is done on this earth as it is in heaven. We thank you and we praise you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, we're going to receive our tithe and offering at this time. Let's sing, He is Lord. 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 Shall rise. 
we just lift up your name in this place. We declare that you are Lord. We declare your lordship. Yes, we know we came. you came in a, in a manger as a babe, but Father, we know why you sent your son. We know the reason he was manifest was to destroy the works of the evil one and declare his lordship. And we do plead, indeed, declare that lordship here today, Father. We want to make you Lord of our lives. We want to make you Lord of this church. We want to make you Lord of our homes. We want to make you Lord of our marriages, Lord God. We want to make you Lord of entirety, everything in our lives, God. Many of us have made you our Savior, but maybe haven't made you Lord of everything, Father. Right now, we lay all of that down, Father, and we declare that you are Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus says, Lord, in this place. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, team. Thank you, team. Bless you. All right. I have a few things I'd like to do before we get started today. We have a couple of several different things we want to acknowledge. One is, did you notice a finely dressed gentleman there in the back? <laughs> is one Paul Ayers, whom we have missed. He has been gone for several months. Let's give him a big hand, please. He's, he's, he's dressed looking pretty good there, man. He should, maybe he should be up here preaching today. Um, we, he's been back in Wyoming for several months, tending to some family issues. Brother, we love you. We're so glad you're back. It's good to see you. All right, so... At, but on the flip side of that, um, we are also losing somebody today, which I was praying against, <laughs> but apparently it was the Lord's will. Um, and uh, our sister Sarah, raise your hand, Sarah. She, this was her last Sunday here. She will be moving back to Texas to be with her family that moved back there several weeks ago. So I'd like to just acknowledge her. Can you come up, sweetie? She is just this short little thing. <laughs> Can hardly even notice her. <laughs> no, she literally stands heads above in the crowd, doesn't she? <laughs> anyway, she has been helping uh, with the sound for, for quite a while, and we really appreciate her. She's quiet. She keeps to herself, but she's very, um, she was very committed. She was very faithful. I want to give her... Uh, acknowledgement of that today. Can we please give her a hand? And then I also uh, want to, we want to pray for her because she will be moving Wednesday, right, to Texas uh, to join her mother and dad. So can we do that? Father, we just lift up this young lady. Lord, we just bless her. Father, we thank her. We, we do thank her for her service, God, but we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in her life. God, that you have given her the talents that she has used for you, Lord. I pray, God, that this season, Lord, as it comes to an end here and it begins back there, Lord, we, we know that you are a God of seasons and you are doing something in her life, Lord. Give her a safe journey um, as she travels during the winter time, Lord. I've made that very journey that she's made to Texas several times, Lord, in my life, and, and I know it can be crazy out there. Lord, I just pray that for safety, I pray, God, that you would be with her all the way, Lord. God, may she be aware of your presence and bless her back there, Lord. I pray that she would be able to get assimilated quickly, Lord, and begin this new season of her life, Father. We just celebrate her today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give her a hug tonight or today on your way out of here, please. She told, I heard about it several weeks ago, and I said, good, I have time to pray against that demon. And, uh, but apparently it was God's will, so that's all right. We do miss her parents, and now we will miss her uh, as she leaves. So now... Um, I, I, um, I, I thought about how I would present this next part to you, and, and I had a, a big speech prepared, but I just thought I'd share from my heart, and that is any pastor who's concerned for his church and you want, you want it to grow, you want it to th flourish, you want the spirit to be welcomed into place, and you want to see people's lives changed, and, and uh, you have, you know, you have ideas, you have thoughts, we have things going. Nobody plans for a pandemic to hit, right? And that caught us all by surprise. 
and just changed all of our lives, really. We have, we, when we have a new normal, as it were. Many are still watching from home and are in our church, and we became a, a live stream church overnight. I mean, overnight, and I was just, it started out for the first few weeks. My wife and I literally had a tripod and my iPhone in our living room, <laughs> and we did it that way while we were completely sheltered in place. And then little by little, our team, I'm so proud of our team that um, got the equipment going and quickly became a good live streaming church. And I want to do that. I want to continue with that because we reach, we reach many more this way. But then now the, the pandemic is, is over, and I know it's still kind of holding on. In fact, a few of us in, our, in this congregation have COVID right now, by the way. So it's not completely gone. <laughs> still showing its head. But... Um, then it becomes incumbent upon uh, leadership and pastor to try to get back to where we were pre-COVID. <laughs> uh, at least that's where I started out in my thinking. And thinking about where we were numbers-wise, thinking about where we were with programs and things that were going on, and getting a little frustrated here and there, frankly, about some things, and then continuing to pray with this whole idea of God, just return us back to pre-COVID uh, status, as it were. But God, I want you to know that God corrected me in that. He did. And it was gentle, but it was firm and clear that God's not a God of going backwards. <laughs> He's not interested in going back and restoring it to any kind of place that we were in the past. Guess what He's a God of? The new. Amen? He's a God of the new. And He wants to do a new thing. And so I started changing the way that I prayed started changing the way that I sought the Lord on behalf of this church. And I said, okay, God, what do you want to do now? And I started thinking of the good from the past. We don't want to throw everything out. Of course, we have the vision of who we are as a church, and we have our mission and all of that. And we want to be that safe place where people can heal and not hide, for sure. We know that recovery is a big part of who we are. We have a thriving uh, Celebrate Recovery ministry that meets here on Monday nights. And, and so we know the DNA of how God made us to be here at Crossover Church of God. How can we take that forward? And I began to pray about that, and I began to quickly see things that we're not doing, things that aren't in place that we could and should be doing that are part of that vision. And so I began to reflect on myself and, um, and be honest with myself. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? I believe leadership should stay in their own lane, amen? <laughs> if, if this church is solely dependent on what I do personally, then I am, I'm limiting this church. I don't want this church to be limited by just me. God has placed many people here and, uh, uh, and raised them up in leadership to where we can experience different ideas, callings, colors, textures, and all of that. And I want it to be a rich experience for this church. So I, again, I started seeing openings and holes and things that areas that should be uh, being done, things that should be done that maybe I'm not so good at, or maybe I'm not called in. And at the same time, also, God was raising up and has been for many years one of the most faithful women of God I've ever met in my entire life. Anybody that knows Twyla knows that she is faithful. She is called. She is anointed. And she will do anything that this church needs. I know that she is the ultimate utility player. <laughs> she would do anything, including cleaning this church, and she would do it with excellence. By the way, she did do that. That's how humble she is. And so, uh, but... Are we using, it's been this thing for a little while as she's seeking the, seeking the Lord and going on her own life trajectory. You know, we, we have these things going on and we have what God's doing in my heart and they collided <laughs> because it's time to be intentional about our sister Twyla. Come on up, sister. We want to bless her. Let's give Twyla a hand, please. We, so we, I went to the Church of God. I did it all right, and, um, and I sent them a letter requesting that we make Twyla, she has credentials, she got her credentials a while back, that we make Twyla an intentional part of leadership 
Not just this gray area. Like, well, I know she would do just whatever. If I needed a class taught, she would teach it. If I needed, uh, you know, her to fill in for me on a Sunday when I'm out of town, she's always there, right? But we want to be intentional about it. And she is now our assistant pastor. Yeah. Yeah, please stand. So, and that is, that is an official, I just want you to know, you don't, you don't care about this part, but that is an official ranking in the church of God. That's a, that is an official title with a file name, and, and she'll, be, she'll be doing her ministerial reports under that, just like I do as lead pastor. At the same time, we have this young lady here um, who has, has been our administrative pastor for some time. She's also credentialed, and... And so now we have a three-legged stool. You know, a three-legged stool is pretty, pretty, pretty solid, right? Pretty solid. And so we are being intentional about this. We, and so I met with the, uh, with the pastor's council after I talked uh, around about the same time I was talking to the Church of God, and we voted on it, and then we brought it to church leadership last week, and now I'm bringing it to you. So, okay, so, so what? So what, is, what does that mean for Twyla? Well, she will be assisting. This is... I made this. This is this is the roles. I don't want to be very clear with you. you by the way, you can be seated. Uh, I don't want you to have to stand for this whole thing. Um, I want to make it very, very clear. I, I believe that part of my role is to cast vision and be clear about things, make sure you understand uh, this is going to be her role. She's going to assist the senior pastor. That's me. Coordinate with the administrative pastor. That's D. Uh, preach sermons when senior pastor is away, but I also have a slash special events. And what I mean by that is I have given her leeway to, there will be times I know that God's going to place something in her heart that she wants to share. I want you to know I yield this pulpit to this woman whenever she feels like she has something God wants to share. But more than that, my wife and I are also in this season. We have families uh, throughout the country. We're going to be traveling and I've been very intentional about that. And and she's always faithful. If she's available, she will preach. She's my number one go-to on turning this pulpit over. Lord knows I don't turn it over to just anybody. And so <laughs> <clears throat> she's going to oversee. This is so important. Discipleship, <clears throat> the studies, the different studies that are going on, and training. She's very, very good at that. She's called in that. She's going to oversee the ministry vision for the children's church and outreach ministries. So she, she'll be looking at it from a, a, minister's, a ministerial standpoint of, you know, are we reaching the need? Are we, are we bringing what we're supposed to be bringing? Perhaps God, I know, I know her. She's probably already got about 40 ideas. <clears throat> and and, and uh, I can't wait to hear them. She's going to oversee the prayer ministry, and then she'll coordinate with the administrative pastor for the prayer change. D is so good at sending out all those messages, and we keep, I mean, if there's a prayer need, it is on, it is out immediately, right? You get them, we all get them, these messages, and so she'll coordinate with that. She'll oversee the care ministry. Now, this is important. This is something that we haven't been doing well for a while, overseeing the care ministry, visitations, call, making calls, mailings, birthday, anniversary, all of that good stuff, the cards and whatnot. I mean, I, wanna, I don't want to just, I don't want to downplay that. We need to make sure everybody feels connected, amen? But visitation is important. I will be doing some, but she, this is going to, be, going to be part of her own ministry so that I if, I, if I go see somebody, I'll make sure I let her know so she can coordinate that and make sure we're tracking it. There are, there are some of those in the church that have expressed interest. Sandy and Tony, for instance, have expressed interest in being part of the visitation team. Mike Line has expressed interest in being in helping the men stay connected. Let me tell you, that's extremely important. So this is, Twyla is the one that you will report to on that and ask and, and coordinate with. Now, at the same time, there's this uh, interlocking and intertwining between, because D is just, she just uh, is the backbone of all the organization here at the church. She does that so well, right? So she'll be working with Twyla and, and just kind of keeping track of those things. She'll also, Twyla will also collaborate with the senior pastor, that's me, on strategic planning and goal setting. So that's, that's we, what we want to do today is bless 
Twyla, and we want to pray with her. And now what I'd like to do is have you come up, and as you're comfortable, uh, give her a handshake or, or um, give her a hug. We're going to have a little chance to love on her a little bit. But before I get off this, I want to make it clear. I, I want you to understand what each one of our roles are so you'll know who to come to when you have thoughts on things. D, what does D do? So she's the administrative pastor. She assists me, of course. She coordinates now with the assistant pastor. She'll plan and manage church events and community service projects. Does she do that well? Amen. Um, assist the ministry leaders uh, to gather and train volunteers and teams. So as Twyla has these ideas and gets people connected, we're also going to coordinate with D, who will track it. Uh, there's uh, maintaining a calendar. We're still kind of working on how we want to do that, whether it be an online calendar or, how, or just what. Uh, oversee administration of the children's church and outreach ministry. So the ministry part of that will be coming through Twyla, but the coordination will be done with D. She, this is an important role. She performs background check on potential ministry leaders, and she forwards the results to the church clerk for record. That's an important thing we got to do. We want to do things with excellence, right? And so she does that. She maintains a record of church activities and attendance that we forward to the clerk so that we can make our Church of God reports, which we do very well. She's going to oversee, or she does oversee facilities management, building maintenance, supplies, computers, etc. She oversees the media team there in the back, so important. And she oversees usher and greeting teams. So these are important tasks, guys. And uh, we want to get these holes plugged so that we can continue to flourish in the DNA of our church that God's called us to be. Amen? So, okay, so what do I do? That doesn't leave much for me to do, right? <laughs> um, I don't do a whole lot. I'm just the guy that beats his gums here for 45 minutes on Sunday morning, and Wednesday nights. Um, no, my role, it's, I, I'll be clear about it. I, this is what I see that I do well and what I... The, the lane that I want to stay in as, as, your, as your senior pastor or lead pastor, preach and teach. <laughs> I enjoy doing that. I believe that God's called me to do that. God will also give me the vision for this church. I understand that. The vision comes to the lead pastor. Now, now, God doesn't mean that God won't give other people ideas, but I know that the vision casting of who we are and where we're going necessarily comes through the pastor. Also, I believe that I'm more and more being called in the area of counseling, and part of that is the healing ministry. God's placed it on my heart that this, I mean, starting very, very soon, that will be more and more a part of who we are as a church. We are a safe place where people can heal and not hide. Well, guess what? That means we're going to see healings. And, I, and God has given me a passion to pursue that and get that going and and. And I believe that deliverance will be mighty in this place. Yes, I do. I believe that. Amen. And we will Amen. see it. And so that's, and then at the same time, I will be the, the point person and uh, carrying the vision on our building expansion that we believe is getting steam and, going, and getting closer and closer. God gave me that vision. I'm also, besides being your pastor, I'm an engineer. I'm connected in the construction industry. So I have... That is a uh, natural for me. And then I have other men that are really helping me in that. Okay, so that's what we do. <laughs> Hope that's clear. And now what I'd like to do is pray for Twyla. This is about celebrating her addition to this. And now at the same time, I'd like to have my wife join me. This is my wife, Dee Dee. If you didn't know, you know. Everybody knows. She is the church clerk and... She is the best church clerk I have ever worked with. I'm telling you, she has that thing whipped into shape. She's very, she's very strict on me. She doesn't let me slide. You know, I'm kind of loose with the numbers. Like, well, I'll get that in a couple of days. I need it now. I got to do my Church of God report, you know. And, and she gives me balance sheets. Now, I'm a businessman. I see the balance sheets from my own uh, controller at my company. She rivals anything that I get in my business. I get true balance sheets. I don't blame. You. Don't don't give the program credit. You, it's good. It, it's a good yeah, it, it needs somebody uh, to operate that program. Um, and uh, anyway, I want you to know, I want you to know she does a great job with that. But more than that, she is my wife. She shares in my ministerial vision. God has given this woman the gift 
of discernment that I have been relying on more and more lately. God shows her things. Now, God will show us all things, but she has a special gift. She sees things that I don't even see sometimes, and she's very easy with her uh, advice. <laughs> she goes, I, I don't see that. You know, well, you need to look into this. And I go, what? And then she's usually right. <laughs> but she, and I, I'm, I'm um, big on that. I, I rely heavily on that. I mean, don't I, do I do that? I, I say, let's pray about this. I need your discernment on this. And so um, also, though, she's also being called to, God's giving her God confidence to step up in her own passions. And she is heading up a new ministry for women that we're going to be starting in most likely January, maybe early February, here at this church called Embrace Grace. Embrace Grace. It's a women's ministry and what? What, just a general women's women's ministry? No, it is aimed at women that are on the borderline between abortion and keeping their baby. And I'm telling you, it is a real and a powerful ministry. Um, I I think the world of it, I had to be trained. In order for them to come to our church, they they ran me through the the rigors. And, uh, And I fully agree with their ministry. It's a powerful ministry. And it's going to be great. We're going to celebrate the women that come in. And, 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 and as they, they make that an all-important decision, where the church, guess what? The church is going to get a chance to rally around these women. We're going to have baby showers. We're going to have photo ops. We're going to have professional photography come in and really do it up and, make, and just love on these young ladies uh, that are making this important decision. She had the passion to start that. And so God is calling her to that. Let's give her a hand, please. Yeah, Vicki is also uh, co-leading with her, and we're so thankful for these ladies. That's a powerful thing. So, okay. So, uh, and and besides uh, my wife, we got Dwight, come up here and join your wife, please. And Paul, can you come up and join your wife, please? We are being intentional about the relationship of these six people right here. And we're getting, we're going to be getting together intentionally, praying together, and then there's, I mean, these, there's these different levels, but this, this six right here, we are being called to a tighter bonding together, of praying together, sharing together, holding each other up, casting the vision for what God wants to do, because I do believe it's going to be a whole new thing, amen? amen. And then, of course, we have our pastor's council that is solid and in place, and then we have our church leadership. But these, these six right here are going to be the ones leading the way. And, and I want you to know that we don't take any of this lightly. I appreciate DeWitt. DeWitt's on our pastor's council. And he's also going to be supporting Twyla in her role. Paul has, has helped out in the past so much in not only working our sound, but getting it set up. And there's nobody more faithful than Paul as far as helping out in a utility player in, a, in his own right. So we're so glad to see you, brother. So glad you're here. So this is us. This is us going forward. Now we want to pray for Twyla. And then what I'd like to do is have you guys come up and just love on her a little bit, and then we'll keep, we'll keep rolling, okay? Let's all gather. We're going to just the six of us here gather around. If you don't mind, just extend your hand out, please, and join us. Father, in Jesus' name, we lift up this woman of God. Father, you have called Twyla. We believe, Lord, for such a time as this. God, this is the time, Lord, you have brought, you have, you have brought her path journey, Lord, in collision with what you want to do in this church, Lord. I believe that she is part of this new thing that you want to do. You have given her ideas. You have given her wisdom. You've given her uh, uh, a passion. But more than that, God, you've given her a divine anointing, God, of favor, Lord. And I pray that that anointing would be strong going forward, Lord. I pray, God, that you would make it clear, Lord, God. Give her favor, Lord, in whatever doors need to be opened, Lord, for these, in order for these ministries and these, uh, these activities, Lord, to be organized in our church, God. I pray, Father, that you would be with her, Lord. Give her physical strength, mental strength, uh, but most of all, spiritual, uh, 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 not only strength, Father, but just acumen, Lord, God. Oh, God, make your calling strong and clear on her, Father. We pray in Jesus' name, Lord. We pray for her household. I pray, Father, that uh, that 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 Father, that you would just uh, put a hedge of protection around them, Lord. I know that for ex- uh, for from experience, Lord, that when any anybody steps out, Lord, in leadership, uh, God, there's a target, 
And Lord, I pray, God, for their home. I pray for their extended home, Lord, their kids, Lord, and their grandkids, Father. I pray, God, you would have put them around, uh, wrap your arms around them, put a hedge of protection around them, Lord. I pray, God, for anybody that is straying, Lord, that they would come back to you, Father, and that they would see your mighty hand, God. Give them victory in their family, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on up, please. Give her another hand, please. Come on up. Give her a hug or a handshake, however you like to do it, and we'll move on. All right, let's move on. Great day. Amen. Such an important announcement today. Kind of a nice time to do it, too, I have to admit, right around Christmas time. All right, so let's just dive right in. Repeat after me, please, on the screen. I open my heart to receive from the Word of God. God's promises are true, and they are true for me. So, indeed, what I'm about to preach is true for you and Part of that, I just want to say, Merry Christmas, amen, Merry Christmas, and Jesus is the reason for the season, (laughs) amen. So, perhaps you've heard of the phrase, you ever heard of the phrase, light at the end of the tunnel? Light at the end of the tunnel, you probably heard that before, it indicates, it indicates that after a time of waiting and striving, the time of darkness and hardship may be coming to an end, right? It's a time of optimism, it's a phrase of optimism. In other words, the light is starting to appear. It's a beacon of hope, right? I mentioned the pandemic earlier. We saw that in the pandemic, didn't we? I mean, this pandemic hit out of nowhere. We're all shocked. Months and months of sheltering in place, and then we're able to get out a little bit. We're wearing masks, a mask mandate, vaccine mandate, all that hubbub. Months and months of of this, hospitalizations and even some COVID deaths. We saw that this thing wasn't messing around. And then we saw the light at the end of the tunnel. We saw things start to change, didn't we? We saw the hospitalization rates begin to be reduced. We saw the infection rates begin to drop. Or another example might be a couple in debt, maybe a falling deeper into debt, and there seems to be no way out. But after some hard budget decisions and some timely, maybe a timely raise in pay, there is suddenly a light at the end of the tunnel, right? Some of the most tragic things that have happened to the human race have lights, have little, have have stories of optimism and hope, such as the Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, the Nazi prison camps. You hear stories of some of the Jewish people that survived that horrific event, and they are asked what may help them survive, and many of them will say. What helped them was a 
the hope of a brighter future, right? Maybe perhaps being reunited with their family in some way. The light at the end of the tunnel, it's, a, it's, it's about the light of hope beginning to shine. And because of that light, we suddenly have the ability to embrace the possibility of the impossible. See, that's, you know, that's it. It's not just a, it's not just like we're crossing fingers and going, oh, I wish upon a star like Disney. No, we're hoping the hope begins to be, uh, start to burn. And all of a sudden, things that seemed unreachable, all of a sudden, maybe reachable. Things we thought impossible, maybe just might be possible. So, why is this hope so important? Well, I just want to submit to you that hope is a lifeline. It's an absolute lifeline. It's what leads us to grow and move forward. Without hope, we die, right? Isn't that true? I mean, we literally, I mean, what's the opposite of hope? The opposite of hope is despair. In fact, the definition of despair is literally the loss of hope. And despair, I don't know how it worked for you, but in my life, despair has done nothing but destroy. Is destroy, has this despair ever done anything productive? I don't think so. But there's another reason that hope is so important, and it's this, and I, this is a phrase I say periodically. When there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. Is that, that's a true statement. If there's no faith in the future, there's no power in the present, right? Guys, this is timely, not only because it's Christmas time, but I believe that God is going to indeed start to do a new thing in this place. Did you know that God is not a God of the past? Can I say that again? God is not a God of the past. He doesn't see your best days behind you. Somebody needs to hear me say that again. God does not see your best days behind you. He never said you're done. He never said quit. He never said it's time for despair. In fact, he's quite the opposite he's, because God is a God of hope. He is all about hope. And church, we are called to hope. We are called to power. Power. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of what? Power. How are we doing on the power? It's time for power. Amen? It's time for power. It's, time to, it's not time to give up. It's not time to be negative. It's time to hope in what God has promised and then go after it and fight for it. Amen? But see, here's the thing. We will not fight for anything without hope, <laughs> right? Can you imagine being in the trenches in war with a guy next to you that has no hope? Eh, what's the use? Man, we're going to charge, you know, we're going to charge the enemy. And I'm, I got, you know, the guy next to me that I'm not even sure if he has my back, man. I'm not even sure if he has anything. I don't want to be next to that guy in the trenches, right? Without hope, we're never going to fight for anything. So God wants us to have hope because he wants you to fight for some things in your life. Then I feel the Spirit just rise up in me as I said that. There are unsaved loved ones that God never told you to stop praying for. There are miracles in your life that God never said quit on, and we've quit on. It's time to re-spark that hope, amen? God wants us to have hope, so he gives us literally the light of hope. Literally. So today I want to talk to you about the familiar story of the three magi, right? The three magi or the three wise men. We have songs, right? We three kings of Orient are, right? It's those guys. Let's read about it. It's in Matthew 2, and it, and it lends itself to this topic that I'm talking about today. Matthew 2, starting at verse 1, it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, was, when he heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chiefs, or chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. 
Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. We know better. <laughs> he was not up to any good there, right? After they heard the king, excuse me, and think that moved. Thank you. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to the country by another route. So the magi, the wise men, as it were. Have you ever noticed how prominently, though, this is the story of the magi? And like I said, songs have been written about this. But have you ever noticed how prominently the star plays a role in this story? Can you show that next graphic there? Four times. If you did, if, I know you weren't counting. But four times in the story that I just read, the star was mentioned. So I want to offer you a few observations. I'll try to keep it short today. I want to offer you a few observations about this star for this Christmas season and beyond. That's the thing. I don't want to just preach a Christmas message and, you know, go home and decorate your tree and cook a ham and, and, and enjoy. You know, that's all fine and dandy. But I want to know what's God saying today and beyond. We're about to enter a new year. We're about to start something new at this church. What is God saying here? Well, my first observation about this star, this star is that it was a beacon of hope. It was a beacon of hope. It was a light at the end of the tunnel, in other words. The star appeared in the darkness and shone over the spot, literally over the spot that Jesus was born. That was the point of hope. You ever thought about it that way? The star stopped at the point of hope, the point where light was literally piercing the darkness. So Jesus came, guys, to bring hope that pierces the darkness. That's what Christmas is all about. In fact, the song, the familiar song we sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, says, Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Light and life to all he brings. He, he has come to bring light into our darkness. Amen. <laughs> and healing in his wings. We're at a time of we're at a season of healing now. That I interrupted our sermon series just today, but when this sermon series that we're in right now is called a season of healing. We believe God wants to bring healing. So we say to the Lord, we respond like the prophet that says, "Heal me, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved." For you are the one I praise, Lord. In other words, God, when you heal, I'll really be healed. But see, when I try to heal myself, Lord, it's always tainted. It's always tainted. It's always my way. It's, it's never complete. It's always incomplete. It's always riddled with my own brokenness. But when you heal me, I will be healed. When you save me, I'll really be saved. I can't save myself. Are you kidding? All I'm capable of is behavior modification. You think about it. That's all I'm capable of is behavior modification. I can't save myself. Are you kidding? If I could save myself, I wouldn't need a savior. So indeed, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. John 1 puts it this way. Uh, if you could show that, please. Through him, him being Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing that has been made was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Did you notice that that's there? The light, see? Look how that ties in. He was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness has not overcome it. Now, another version of that, another translation says, the, the darkness cannot extinguish the light. <laughs> Did you know that? The light that Jesus brings cannot be extinguished by a culture that is going opposite the direction he is. Did you know that many people believing the wrong thing does not make something that's wrong right all of a sudden? 
Jesus isn't concerned about what the culture is doing. Jesus isn't concerned about what popular opinion is. He, his light will not be extinguished by public opinion, by what's popular, or anything else. His light shines, and it will not be extinguished. Let me just tell you, I told you a minute ago I'm an engineer besides being a pastor. So I throw out little things about physics and things now and then because I'm kind of nerdy that way. Let me tell you about darkness. Did you know that darkness is not a substance? <laughs> the darkness isn't something that you can grab. It's not quantifiable. It's not containable. Darkness is what? The absence of light. <laughs> darkness is literally the absence of light. That's all it is. So darkness is creeping in. We think we're, we're, we're doomed our kids are doomed. We're, we feel them tearing apart the darkness, tearing apart our marriage. We feel financial stress. We feel we worry about the future. We feel the darkness creeping in. Oh, no, darkness is coming. Darkness isn't anything other than the absence of light. So what do I mean by that? What's the remedy? Light. <laughs> the light shines in the darkness. That's all we have to do is look for the beacon of hope right? The light. Jesus is the light. He wants to breathe. He wants to shine in the darkness of our lives. And later in John, John 8, Jesus identifies himself as the light again. He says, he spoke to the people and he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Praise God. So what does that mean? Well, get this. Jesus gives us light so we don't have to walk in the darkness. That's what that means. <laughs> I don't want to walk in the darkness. How about you? I did that. Tried that. Didn't work. A lot of people choosing to walk different ways these days, and it always leads to, to some dark end. I mean, look at how many, how many celebrities have gone, crashed and burned over the, over the years in our lifetime. They reach a place of stardom that they strived for and wanted so badly and riches and all of that, and were miserable. And so they just lose their minds and they do all kinds of crazy things or even worse. And you think, wow, how could that have happened? Well, because can you imagine thinking that that was what it was all about? And if, they could, if I could just have this, if I could just have that, then I will arrive as if there's some kind of place of arrival. And they get it and they realize they're just as miserable then as they were before. How utterly depressing that would be. I think I might start drinking or doing something then if, I had, if that's all I had. See, that's the thing, because we don't have the remedy. We cannot change anything in our lives other than our behavior. Jesus is the one that brings us light so that we don't have to walk in that darkness anymore. Let me tell you, I, you guys know my story, but I grew up in this church. Literally, I came here when I was seven years old, and I'm 58 now. That's a long time. I could say, oh, that's all I know. Well, that's all right. I love this church. I go to other churches. I see what other people are doing. But you know what? I want to know what, what's God doing at this church. And I've, seen, and I've seen a lot of things over the years. And I tell you what, I, could, I grew up, I could even mimic ministers. I can do their whole mannerisms and all of that. Man, you know that, I don't know, for some reason, ministers do this when they're all standing around together, you know, and, oh, Lord, you know, they do that kind of stuff, and, you know, they get their necktie too tight, you know, and they get all puffy and, and all that. You know, I could, I, I've seen it all. I've heard it all. But you know what? Growing up in a church and being the pastor's son makes me no more Christian than being in a garage makes me a car. See, I came to a place where my whole life came to a crashing end because I thought that I, I knew better. I thought I could make my own way. So I tried God and this, God and partying, God and the booze, God and all of these other things. And guess what? It all came to a crashing halt. And I realized then and then, on 19, I'll tell you exactly when it was. It was in March of 1998 when I was on my way to my first rehab meeting. And I had realized I had lost everything, and I was even suicidal. I even, I even thought about stopping and stepping out into traffic. I really did because of the gravity of the situation. And I realized that I had no way. I, my heart was pounding so, so hard in my chest. You ever, you ever be able to look down at your shirt and see your heart pound? Literally, you can see it. It was literally going like this. Such panic. The gravity of the situation was on me. I lost everything. I couldn't even see my own daughters. 
and the gravity of all I called out right there in my truck. But I said this, I said, God, all my life I have known of you. See, knowing of God and knowing God are two different things. I'm going to tell you that right now. Knowing of God means I know of him, but I'm still walking in the darkness. I'm still trying to do it my own way. And you know what? I came to a place where I was literally ready to step out into traffic to end it all. That's what that got me. And I said, all my life I've known of you, Lord. If you're real, I need you now more than ever. (laughs) And it was as if he said to me, that's all I've been waiting for you to say. That moment, my life changed. That moment, I made the decision to turn my life and my will over to the care of God who loved me and had a better way for me, see? And then all of a sudden, it was real for me. And it wasn't just a bunch of Sunday school stuff. I made it mine. And all of a sudden, all of that darkness, guess what happened? The light of heaven penetrated. And see, the darkness cannot extinguish it. My life has been different ever since that day. Ever since that day. March 11th, 1998, literally the last night, my lips touched liquor. They have not touched it once since. But it's so much more than just getting sober. I have found out I had to get sober so I could start dealing with the real issues of my life. I still had a lot of darkness. You know that you can come to church, you can be a Christian, you can even be in leadership and still have darkness in your life. You know that depression's dark. You know that anxiety's pretty dark. You know that... um, that, that worry is pretty dark. Uh, division in your marriage is still pretty dark. Division in your family, uh, worries about the future. I could go on and on and on. There's still darkness, and that light needs to penetrate all the way in because darkness cannot stand up to it. And Jesus gives us light so that we don't have to walk in darkness. I don't have to try to figure out my marital issues on my own. I didn't have to get sober on my own. Trust me, man, I've I proven quite well I could not do that. I want to tell you, honestly, I'm just this honoring. One time, years ago, years prior to me getting sober for the real, for the, for the, for the, really for the first time, I even did it for a year. I said, okay, you don't think I can quit drinking? I'll show you. I'm that guy. I've always been that guy. I'll show you. I did it for a year just to show that I could do it. That's how honoring I am. And then after a year, I said, see, I told you I could do it. Now I can have a drink. Wrong. Let me tell you, man, you pick up right where you left off. For me, a, one drink is a 1,000, and a 1,000 will not be enough. You see, I couldn't do that on my own. I needed something greater than me to do for, for me what I could not do for myself. That light had to pierce that darkness and do for me something that was uh, supernatural. Okay, so what do I mean about darkness. Again, what are you saying, Pastor? Well, I want to, first of all, I want to say that there's nothing darker than sin. If you don't know where you stand right now with the Lord, if you don't know where you would spend eternity right now if you were to die, Jesus wants to bring light and life to that right now. Right now. Why not? That's the most important decision that you will ever make. Your eternal life begins the moment that you believe. Did you know that? The moment you believe, you're all of a sudden now a resident of heaven. Look what it says in in Romans about the subject. It says, for the wages of sin is death. That means the payoff. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 John 1.9 says it this way. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And what? Purify us from all unrighteousness. In other words, the light will pierce the darkness. Amen. I just submit to you, what better day than today to take him up on his free gift and let that light shine into the darkness of our hearts, see? And as you can see, there's God's part and then there's our part. Jesus said, remember what Jesus said? Uh, He said, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Get that. The the, The follows me, those two words, that indicates a choice, doesn't it? Why not make the choice today, this, this Christmas season? What, a, what an awesome time to change your eternity. Amen. I'm going to give you a chance at the end here in just a few minutes. But I want to move on. Because what do we do with this gift? Well, we confess, yes, we just said that, but we also believe and receive. Look what also it also says in John 1. The true light, notice that, 
the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. That's Jesus coming down and taking human form. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to which that which was his own, but his own did not recognize. And that's, that's talking about how he came to the Jews first, and then the idea was that, that they would go to the rest of the world. They did not recognize him, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but what? Born of God. Get that. Believe and receive. Believe and receive. That's our part. Believe and receive. And I would, I would add to that, I would say believe and receive while there is time. <laughs> Look what Jesus said in John 12. Then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Did you know that darkness, <laughs> do you know that Satan is not satisfied at plateauing with you? He is out to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to overtake you. Remember the words that Jesus said to Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, this is before he changed his name to, to Peter, which means rock. He says, Satan has requested to sift you like wheat. Man, that means he's going to throw up in the air and just and have this thing. And then whatever, whatever gets blown in the wind is the chaff that was, and then wherever it falls down. And, you know, Satan wants to do that with you. He wants to find out what you're made of. He wants to overtake you. But Jesus said this, whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Boy, I can vouch for that. Oh, I thought I knew. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. Believe and receive, guys, while there is time. Okay, Second observation about the star. I want to point out to you real quickly that God, God placed this star of hope. God placed this star. If you notice that in the text that we read in Matthew, it said the star rose into place. You could say, well, okay, well, the star rose into place. Well, I don't want to get all nerded out here on you, but stars don't rise. Did you know that? <laughs> There's this thing called Earth's rotation. Can I show you a little... Can we give a little science corner here? Notice the Earth is on an axis. That's 23.5 degree axis, axis, and the Earth is rotating. Get that. Did you know that the Earth rotates at 1,000 miles an hour at the equator? A little factoid means nothing to this, to this message. I just think that's pretty cool. 1,000 miles an hour. Why don't I just spin into space then faster? Well, that's gravity. Gravity is your friend. <laughs> gravity keeps you on the, uh, with your feet on the ground. Okay, well, what's my point? Well, the earth is rotating. One rotation of the earth is what? A day, right? It's rotating. And so as the earth rotates, guess what? The stars and the sun appear to rise. You know, we say sunrise and sun, sunset. The sun doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> In fact, you know, right on your parade there, it's the earth that's moving. And it makes it look like the sun is. Well, and, okay, so what is this? A science lesson? No, the point is, is that they're stationary. It's the rotation of the earth that makes the stars move in the sky. So you could say, well, okay, pastor, then that's it. It was the earth's rotation that made the star appear above Jesus. But remember, it said these three magi saw the star rise to where? To the place above Jesus' manger. <laughs> the earth's diameter is so large that we can't see the rotation with our naked eye. Has anybody seen the earth rotate? I just want to know. When you go outside, do you see the earth rotate? Like, whoa, I'm getting dizzy from all this rotation, right? You don't see it. It just happens. You just go out and the stars are in the sky, right? By the time it's dark, you see the sky, the stars. You don't see them moving. I just submit to you that God made this star rise into place. Because also notice in the story it says, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over a place, over the place where the child was. Stars don't do that. 
You get what I'm saying? Unless there's a greater power at work here. The star went ahead of them and stopped literally above Jesus. So, so much for the theory that it was the earth's rotation. I just submit to you guys that God placed this star of hope and he moved it as he saw fit. Okay, so what's the point? Well, the point is that God can use whatever means he deems necessary to bring you hope. <laughs> Let me tell you, he can do it. We saw recently, we studied the idea that Jesus changed water to wine. I mean, and I, and I got a little nerdy on that one too. I, he, didn't, he didn't just put food coloring in it and, and get some wine flavoring or something when nobody was looking. He changed it at a molecular level. At a molecular level, he instantly changed water to wine. He can change the state of anything in your life. He can do whatever he wants. Amen? So let's say this, nice, this next phrase really quickly here. I'm getting close to ending. God can do whatever he wants to bring light to your dark situation. Amen? He can do whatever he wants. And he will if we would trust him. Trust him. Don't give up. Praise God. Well, last observation about the star. God placed this star to lead them to his son. I mean, don't let the obvious be too obvious. We got to get that. He wasn't just leading them randomly. Where was he leading them? Hey, here's my son. Let's look at this the neon arrow pointing downward. Here it is. X marks the spot, right? The star stopped right above Jesus for one reason, so that the magi, the wise men, would find Jesus in the darkness. See, if it wasn't dark, they wouldn't need a star, right? God would have used it another way, but it was dark. So he put a star right above Jesus. He wants us to find him too, by the way. That's the Christmas story. God leading us to find Jesus in the darkness. What is the darkness that you're dealing with? I just submit to you, come to Jesus in the darkness of your addiction. Come to Jesus in the darkness of your marital problems. Come to Jesus in the darkness of your worries and your fears about the future, amen? You may feel that you have nothing to give like the wise men did. They had gifts. I got nothing to give. You maybe have a broken heart. You have a broken life. But Jesus is here, and he's saying, come, 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 would you come? Come to the Father. There's a song I loved that we used to sing years ago. Before the world began, you were on his mind. And every tear you cry is precious in his eyes. Because of his great love, he gave his only son. And everything was done so you would come. Nothing you could do could make, you, make him love you more. And nothing that you've done could make him close the door. Because of his great love, he gave his only son. Everything was done so you would come. Come to the Father, though your gift is small, broken hearts, broken lives, he'll take them all. The power of his word, the power of his blood, everything was done so you would come. Guys, God is drawing you. God is leading you with the light of hope, and that light stops at his son. It stops at his son. So I'm going to close with these two statements here, and they go together. Jesus is the answer for whatever your problem is. Stop. The search is over. <laughs> the search is over. Jesus is the answer to whatever your problem is. Second point, God wants you to find Jesus in the darkness of your situation. Amen? That's, that's what Christmas is all about, guys. That's what Christmas is all about. So praise God. I want to pray a prayer of conclusion. But at the same time, I, I, have, I, I am not leaving this place so everybody that wants prayer gets it because I feel like some things need to be prayed about today. Amen? Whatever, whatever the darkness of your situation is, I would just encourage you to come. So this is what I like to do. I, did, I promised a few minutes ago I was going to give you a chance to make sure you're right with the Lord, and we're going to do that right now. I said a minute ago, 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It's all a matter. Confess just means to agree with. It goes like this. Repeat after me. Let everybody close their eyes, please. If you're watching at home, I encourage you to participate in this. Lord Jesus, 
I am a sinner. I need you. Forgive me of my sins. I pray that your light would pierce my darkness. I feel like I have no hope in what I face, but I hear that you are the light, and I pray that you would do just that. Light up my darkness. Heal me, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. I make you my Savior and my Lord in your name. Amen. Praise God. That's it. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when one person comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now let me pray a, a general prayer of closure, and then I'd like to pray with you if you'd like to come up. I'll ask my wife to join me. We'll pray with you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this season. We thank you for this message of hope today that we received. I pray, God, that it would just shine in us, Lord God. Let that light pierce our darkness, Lord. I speak the name of Jesus over marriages that are struggling. I speak the name of Jesus over people that are waiting for healing. I speak the name of Jesus for those that are in need of financial breakthrough, Lord, or just questions answered, God, about their future, Lord. Whatever it is, I speak the name of Jesus, and I speak directly to depression. Satan, you have no authority over the children of God. We are called to power, Lord. So give us that power, Father, we pray. And be with us, Lord, as we go our ways, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. I went about five minutes over. I usually shoot for about 11, 15. Be sure to put that on your time card. We'll get you paid over time. So bless you. Well, I'm not leaving. If you'd like to pray, please come on up.